things that seems to be for free, you still pay for them. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you do a, a Google search, you pay for the service with your data. With your data. You're the product. You're the product. And, and the thing is that sometimes I think you, you get a bad deal. to shape our common answers to the global threats we are facing. We are declaring that America is in the game and America is going to win. Dysfunction has a price. No, it's not something you need to discuss with your doctor. It's the transatlantic alliance that may be on the fritz. I'll dig into it and then sit down with someone on the front lines of that divide, a woman who strikes fear in the heart of Silicon Valley. Then, of course, I've got your puppet regime. But first, a word from the folks who help us keep the lights on. Americans and Europeans, we've had a lot more to scuffle over since President Trump began shaking up US foreign policy. Let's break it down, three points. First, diplomacy. There was, for example, Trump's decision to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord, a move that hardened his base as part of Trump's pledge to bolster American industry. Europeans didn't like it. Second, economics. Trump ordered tariffs on European steel. Same deal. America first is a driving philosophy of this White House. Third, security. There was public doubt about the value of NATO, the U.S.-European military alliance, and his charge that other members were free riding on American generosity. Of course, some argue that kind of criticism was long overdue. But here's the thing. All three come to a head when you're talking about Iran and that controversial nuclear deal. In a couple of weeks, U.S. sanctions will get much tighter. Their impact on Iran's economy probably mean that the deal is about to die. And that will only add to the growing bitterness in U.S.-European relations. The French, the Germans, and the Brits say they've spent years negotiating that agreement, and it was working. They say this decision will make the Middle East more dangerous. They also seem to resent U.S. threats on sanctions on the European companies that want to do business with Iran. Trump isn't exactly happy either. He says Iran supports terrorism and destabilizes the Middle East. And he says he can force Tehran to accept a much better deal. Now, the U.S. and Europe have had disagreements before. Don't mention the war. In fact, President Trump's current low approval ratings in Europe are virtually identical to those that George W. Bush had a decade ago. And we all remember how Bush's 2003 invasion of Iraq united France, Germany, and Russia in opposition to the U.S. But this time, it really is different. Unlike President Trump, Bush never questioned the value of NATO. He didn't threaten a large-scale trade war on European partners. More importantly, back then, Europe itself hung together. But the Cold War that bound the U.S. and Europe was almost 30 years ago. Things change. Relationships age. Nothing lasts forever, even among your family. And by many accounts, Russia is really enjoying watching a good fight. Later in this program, I'll speak with European Commissioner for Competition, Margrethe Vestager. She'll help me break down this divide, how it impacts cyberspace, and why Mark Zuckerberg may stop returning her calls. Jeff Bezos, too. Sorry, are you asking if Cambridge Analytica's data could be stored in Russia? In the words of the head of Google's search ranking team, Google is, quote, the biggest kingmaker on Earth. My position is not that there should be no regulation. The fine of 2.42 billion euros. Margrethe Vestager has been called the world's most powerful regulator of your everyday tech companies. Think Facebook, Google, and Amazon. It's her job to ensure they follow European Union rules, and she has the power to penalize those that don't. It's a cudgel she is not afraid to use. Now here's the rest of my conversation with European Commissioner for Competition, Margrethe Vestager. These tech companies, which have been some of the biggest cases mm -hmm. that you've been launching, um, are very fast moving. Mm. They're very fast changing. Governments, in particular, when we think about the European Union, the European Commission, not so fast moving. How do you, um, how do you effectively regulate? How do you effectively launch cases in an environment that is so incredibly fluid? 
Well, I think for any law enforcer, there is a um, inbuilt asymmetry. If you look in a break-in in a house, it may take five minutes, but it may take five months to find the person, to prove the, the, the crime, to get he or she convicted and put away. And, and that goes for everything. It takes no time to break things. It takes a lot of time to do the casework, actually, to bring justice. And, and the thing is that we can never compromise on, uh, on due process. It's a union built on the rule of law. You have the right to defend yourself, to see the evidence we hold against you, to, to answer for yourself. So that, of course, is, is an inherent thing in everything we do. That being said, uh, we are speeding up. Uh, both in the way we do casework, in the way we ourselves digitalize uh, in order to do that, and of course also trying to look ahead. Now there's clearly a very different perspective on privacy and data in Europe compared mm -hmm. to the United States mm. and compared to China. Um, do you think that Europe is driving a set of regulations around data and privacy that will become the standard across the West, including here in the United States? Well, that remains to be seen. Uh, but it has the scale to fulfill that. And since these uh, rights are very fundamental, that you own your data, mm -hmm. that you can take them, you have the right to take them from one provider to another provider, that you have the right to be forgotten, uh, these are things that I think they, they ring a bell with most people, that I have a right to, to what I create and I have a right also to be myself. Uh, and in that respect, uh, of course, we hope not well, we want to set a standard uh, in Europe, but we also hope to inspire others. When you look at the cases that you've launched thus far, mm -hmm. um, what do you think, what, what, are, what are the landmarks that you feel proudest of, where you feel like you've really changed the landscape for the average European? Oh, that, that's like asking someone to choose among children. Yeah, well, <laughs> I would, I would you never. You can't say it publicly, but privately, we all have no, no, no. I, I would yeah. never do that. But I'd say that cases are different. We have this uh, prohibition of harmful subsidies, mm -hmm. uh, which means that you cannot give an ailing company a very cheap loan that they couldn't get in the marketplace. Uh, that you cannot hand out uh, building lots or cash, but you cannot hand out out uh, tax benefits either. And. Um, and in order to have a level playing field, well, everyone will have to pay their due taxes. And I think the tax work that we have been doing, I think that's, that's important, uh, because that also shows all the businesses who pay the taxes, and that's the majority. It shows all the people who work in businesses who really, really have to work hard to make a profit, to pay their taxes. For people who go home and then pay their taxes of their income, uh, that is for everyone. So this is the Apple case in That's particular, That's the Apple case example. in particular. So why don't you walk me through that uh, for just a moment, because this was an enormous settlement, right? It was, uh, it was, I think no one would like to have sort of the tax man coming to collect 13 billion euros. It's, it's a lot of money. Which they've now paid. Which they have now paid. Yes. Uh, they also appealed our decision, so mm -hmm. the money will stay on a closed account and wait for the court to, to finalize their, their readings. But the thing was that we found that Apple had enjoyed a couple of tax rulings in Ireland mm -hmm. that allowed them to take uh, profits made in Europe, uh, North Africa, uh, I think all the way to India, uh, and put them in part of the company that had uh, no premises, uh, no activities, uh, and no employees. And it was a tax-free company. And basically, this is not where the, the, the value is created. And if you then put the profit where the value is created, you find that here is actually a taxable presence. And therefore, you have to pay your taxes. And how did you first become aware of the fact that they were doing this? Well, this is the interesting part, because it, it has never been a secret that you have to pay your taxes just like anyone else, that you cannot enjoy these sort of selective advantages that is for you only. Never been a secret. But we all know that you know the, the tax rate is one thing and what yeah. people actually pay is something very different. But this is, of course, that the way this business was organized, that was a secret. And, and the reason why my, my predecessor learned about this was question being asked in the US Senate. The US Senate started asking question about how Apple was organized. And uh, sort of an, on our side of things, we realized something is wrong here. 
So he opened the case and I could finalize it. And that sort of initiated uh, many more investigations. The idea that $15 billion wasn't paid mm. with buildings that literally had no employees, obviously Apple is fully aware mm. of the fact they're doing this in your view, yes? Oh yes, of course. And is this, uh, was this executive decision at Apple? Was this the accountants that came in and said, here's the way we think you can, I mean, did you dig into that? Oh no, we don't. Uh, the motives we don't uh, dig into, but we, of course we say, well, if you pay one year 0.05% in tax, well, probably this is too good to be true. Mm -hmm. And it was. Now, when Starbucks came out and said, actually, we recognize we're probably not mm -hmm. paying as much as we should, we should pay more. What's the response of you as commissioner to that kind of a statement? Well, I think that is good. But, but the thing is that the amount of taxes that you pay shouldn't be sort of a, a voluntary contribution to society. This is, this is not corporate social responsibility. This is the law. But that, did that make you suddenly say, wait a second, is there a regulatory issue here? Were they, were they breaking the law before? Did, you, did that set off an internal investigation to look into Starbucks? No, it was not their, their own uh, statements. Uh, we were looking at that in, in the first place. I see. So let's talk a little bit about the other issues of, you know, sort of monopoly issues mm. over data, for example. I mean, so many of these new tech companies really do dominate the fields they're in. They, they grow so quickly. Um, and I guess there is an open question about the difference between a company that dominates a sector because literally nobody else could remotely develop that scale mm. and one that abuses that. Exactly. Where do you find the abuses in scale of big tech today? I think the important thing to understand about Europe is that we really want you to be successful. No matter the flag you're flying, no matter your kind of ownership, if you have products, services that consumers like, well, go, go. Uh, you're more than welcome to grow. But the thing is that if you grow and you become dominant, you get a responsibility. Because if you're 90% of the markets and the next guy is 5% and the third guy is 5%, obviously competition is weakened. So there are a responsibility on your shoulders. And this we found in the two Google cases that they did not live up to this responsibility. They misused their dominant position uh, in the Android case actually to, to close down on innovation so that customers were denied uh, choice. And, and that happened how? So what happened was that they bought uh, the uh, Android operating system, which is open source, and uh, they still publish uh, the code uh, for everyone to use. That's a great thing. But the thing is that if you uh, if you're a producer's a phone, then you want your your customers to be able to download apps. So you need the Play Store, and Google would say, yes, you can have the Play Store but then you will have to take uh, Google Search and Google Chrome and you will pre-install that so that the out-of-the-box experience would be a Google experience. Mm -hmm. But not only will you pre-install it, we will also pay you so that it's exclusively uh, us you pre-install. And thirdly, if you do anything else, you will lose both the payment and the right to use uh, our uh, services. So if just on one of your phones, you will do something else, we're just out of here. And that, of course, made it impossible for people who produce this phone to accommodate uh, people who said, oh, but I have the new search, I have the new browser, I have the new best thing, would you carry that for uh, potential customers actually to see it? And this is, this is how innovation was, uh, was hampered and, and consumers were denied of choice. Tell the people watching this show why this should matter to them. No one wants to be cheated on. Uh, I think uh, most people want to be respected, uh, also as a customer, that the business respects that uh, if, if you don't find the prices are right or the service is rubbish, then you go to the next guy and you place your business there. Now, you know, a lot of Americans look at Europe and they say they're all socialists over there. And here I am talking to you and you say you want more competition. Um, is this just a bad rap? Do you need to work on your uh, on the view <laughs> from across the pond? Well, I, I wouldn't know that, but but what we see is that competition serves Europeans very well. 
uh, uh, for instance, when it comes to mobile subscri subscriptions, a lot of choice and very different prices, I think, for everyone's purse uh, in a European context. There's a lot of things that, that works because competition drives not only prices down, but also for you to, to actually choose what is it that you really need, what is it that you want. One more thing where, where you should care is that things that seems to be for free, you still pay for them. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you do a, a Google search, you pay for the service with your data. With your data. You're the product. You're the product. And, and the thing is that sometimes I think you, you get a bad deal. You pay too much compared to the service that you get. Uh, for instance, I've stopped having loyalty cards because with a loyalty card, you give uh, the business uh, all the details about what you buy, when you buy it, the quantums you buy, uh, all kind of stuff. And what I get in return is a discount on a washing powder that I don't use. So I get nothing in return for all my data. But it's voluntary, right? Yeah, but you know, the thing is that when you, when you do things, it's very nice that there is an actual price tag. And I think we're moving into a world where it will be much more obvious that we have a value, that we create value, and we can do much more with it than just hand it over for services that may not actually live up to the value of the data that we hand over. So if it was up to you, would these companies be paying you for the data that you're holding out? Oh, that could be one solution. Uh, it could also be a solution that you have sort of data brokers that will allow you sort of to sell off packages of the data that you have created to third party so that others can benefit from the data that you actually own. Where do you see emergent monopoly positions in technology today? Well, one of the things that we're looking into, and this is very early days, we haven't opened a case, we're just trying to understand what mm -hmm. is going on. Uh, that is with Amazon, because they have this dual role that on the one hand side, they are hosting small uh, shops to do e-commerce. The, at the same time, they are themselves a giant when it comes to e-commerce. So we want to understand how they use the data that they get from hosting the little guy mm -hmm. and enabling him to do e-commerce, payment system, distribution, the logistics of doing e-commerce, uh, how that data is being used on the one hand side to improve their own services towards the little guy, or if that's also being used to basically say, well, oh, now we know what is trending, so we basically take over uh, the kind of, uh, of business that we see that all the little guys are doing. Now, we see very clearly that in the world of big tech right now, and certainly we talk cutting edge AI, you've got dominant companies here in the United States, mostly Silicon Valley. You've got dominant companies coming out of China. You don't have dominant companies in Europe. Emmanuel Macron, the French president, certainly said that he wants to really invest much more. Mm -hmm. The Europeans can have a third way. What do you think has prevented that? And do you see your role in part as being uh, a supporter of a European policy that builds those companies. If you're competitive at home, well, then it's much more likely that you're also competitive abroad, that you can really make it. It's not the cuddled favorites that makes it on the big scale. It's those who have the competitive culture that are able to do that. And I think one of the important things about the change in Europe now is that that's been created a much more vibrant uh, entrepreneurial uh, environment and ecosystem. Uh, go to Paris, for instance, uh, to see this and you will feel the bus. But what we're still sort of building up is, for instance, a capital market that supports that. Uh, because uh, back in the days, if you were an entrepreneur, you would always have to go to the bank and you'd create more debts instead of going to a capital market and get capital on board and new competences and all it takes to grow a business because it takes more than just a very clever entrepreneur. Uh, and that is changing right now. And I think that's a very positive development. How is that gonna get resolved? Well, the first thing I have learned in, in, in my working life is that if there's something that you want, you should say it mm -hmm. so that people are not, you know, say, oh, but we didn't know. So we did something else. <laughs> that's, the, that's the first. And the second thing that I have learned is that you should be careful to plan too much. Because very often, uh, the next thing comes here in the corner of your eye, 
and planning sometimes work as blinders. Do you see a future in Danish politics, irrespective of another term here or not? Well, you've been a minister with yes, portfolio. Yes, I have been a there couple for a of while. times, but uh, you know, I, I I would like to be at least ninety, and that gives me forty more years. Uh, and if I want, you've so, just told everyone what your age is on television. I yes, want to really know that. well, I bet you know I'm proud of it yeah. at long last. Uh, so if I ever wanted to, I think I would have time also for a Danish politics if that would be the case. Very good. It was my pleasure. Commissioner Mister, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yes, my name is Mustafa Ali. Given the 2016 election and Russia meddling in our business, what will we do to prevent that for the upcoming election? Mustafa, there actually has been some efforts to ensure state by state that the electronic ballots are themselves more secure. Uh, it's not nationwide regulation, but it still hopefully will matter. But the real issue is not that the Russians are, are trying to break um, our ballots. It's more what they do in the run-up during the election. It's the buying of ads, and it's the fake news, and it's the, you know, bots and fake accounts. Um, and there, it's mostly about self-policing of the companies themselves, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Googles. What are they doing to try to ensure that their algorithms are not effectively hijacked by people that aren't who they say they are. And uh, they are incented um, to not be caught unawares in the midst of this election a second time, but that's very different from saying we're not gonna have the problem. And if the Russians do hit the Americans in ways that we consider unacceptable, how do we respond? So far, no common view on that either, either between the Americans, the president, his own administration, and Congress, and also in terms of what kinds of tools are really available. We're gonna hit them back in cyber and delegitimize their elections? Not exactly a democracy. What are we gonna do, we're gonna put more sanctions on them? You know, we're doing that, it isn't having much impact. No one really thinks that there's a military option, so I, I wish I had a better answer for you. I think the reality is this is a tough one to police. Hi, I'm Andrew, and I'm interested in the Israel-Palestine conflict and where the U.S. allies stand in it. Andrew, Israel-Palestine used to be one of the biggest priorities, both in the Middle East and even globally for a lot of American allies in national security. Uh, it's just not today. Uh, you go and talk to them about uh, what they think matters for their relations with the United States, and Israel-Palestine almost never comes up. It's true that the Europeans in particular were angry at the Americans for deciding to move the U.S. Embassy um, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, that was a controversial measure uh, that makes it much harder to come to uh, an understanding with the Palestinians on uh, the disposition of Jerusalem itself and some future two-state solution. But no one believes we're moving to a two-state solution. Uh, negotiations between Israel and Palestine um, are basically stillborn at this point. Um, and although the Palestinians are doing very poorly economically, um, it's not like there's open conflict that feels like something uh, American allies need to respond to, unlike, say, Yemen or Syria or Iran. So in that regard, there are big differences uh, in their perspectives, but not differences that are going to amount to much in the relations between our countries. And with the World Series approaching, Americans are getting ready for a little baseball. Of course, these days, not everyone has the same ideas about sports, especially not in the land of make-believe. It's puppet regime right here on G-Zero World. Hi, folks. The baseball playoffs are in full swing, and I'm at the ballpark with President Trump, who has a big announcement about our national pastime. That's right, Ian. I've decided to rename the World Series the America Great Series. We are taking our series back. But there are tons of players from other countries. Well, actually, those countries have treated us very unfairly, and we're going to put a stop to it, okay? The Japanese, Venezuelans, Mexico, other countries like the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is American. Well, people are saying there are both sides, Ian, okay? There aren't both sides. Mr. President, 30% of players are foreign born. Who will take their place? Me, Ian. I will take their place. All of their places will be taken by me. I'm gonna sit this dog down. I'm gonna knock this low IQ chump out of here. Time, time out, time. What is that? That guy's kneeling. Why is he kneeling? It's a total disrespect. Mr. President, that's the bat boy. He kneels with the bats until... All right, all right, all right. Now play ball!
Foul ball. What? This is a totally rigged disgrace. I can't even believe. I mean, this is just. Puppet regime. And that is our show this week. We'll be right back here next week. Don't you miss it. Don't even think about missing it. It's important that you stay. Not the whole week, but come back, I mean. In the meantime, if you like what you've seen, check us out on g0media.com. Thank you.